singularity. Singularity. There we go. Tomarigato. Very nice to be here. This is my third time in Japan, and it's a, such an incredible country, and people, and ideas, and energy, um, and a lot of, obviously, innovation that's applied to health and medicine. And what I want to cover in this 45 minutes or so is give you a taste of what is the cutting edge of technology and how that's being applied to the medicine of today and the medicine of the near future, and also hopefully have you think about what you can do in health and medicine, even if you come from other fields outside of biotechnology and medicine. Because many fields are moving quickly, even exponentially, as you've been hearing about here at the Japan Summit. And those can be applied to healthcare in new ways. And, and of course, healthcare is a whole spectrum from our own health and wellness, keeping ourselves healthy, health span, uh, exercise, diet, nutrition. Uh, it's diagnosis, picking up disease early rather than late. It's new forms of therapy that are more personalized and less uh, expensive and less toxic. And we can also apply new ways and new technologies to globalizing health, democratizing healthcare around the planet. And even a role in discovery. We can all play a role in helping reinvent medicine by being part of clinical trials, crowdsourcing new thoughts and new innovation. And of course, as I mentioned, Japan has a great history of many great uh, biotech companies, pharma companies, medical device companies. Some of them are here in the room today. Um, and I think these companies and many of you here have the opportunity to take some of the new exponential technologies and move us into a new, brighter healthcare future. But when we look at healthcare today, it sometimes feels like we're stuck in the past or back to the future. You know, I went to medical school at Stanford. I did my training at Harvard at Massachusetts General Hospital. Um, these are, there I was 20 years ago. And when I go back and visit Mass General Hospital today, 20 years later, it still um, sometimes feels like it's back in the 1880s. The, war, the ward where I spent my first month as a brand, brand new young doctor hasn't really changed much in 20 years. Has the same alarms beeping, maybe some of the same patients, maybe some of the same nurses. They're still using the cutting edge medical communication tool of our day, the fax machine to communicate. You know. So even in great hospitals like Mass General Hospital or Stanford or many of the hospitals here in Tokyo and around Japan, I would argue we're still thinking about healthcare like we have in the past. And we have a new opportunity to rethink and reimagine healthcare, particularly using the Japanese mindset. I was interesting to know that Japanese like visiting the doctor four times more often than, than Americans. I don't know, four times. And you live a lot longer, <laughs> so that helps. Um, and obviously the Japanese market is very important, the number three healthcare market in the world. Um, but you have opportunities and challenges with the aging population and many of the integrated societies and technologies to really, I think, rethink and reshape healthcare into the next generation. And that, that future medicine doesn't need to look like today, you know, where you sit in a waiting room and wait for an hour to see the doctor, whether you're in San Francisco or here in Tokyo. Those things can change with some of the new mindsets and technologies that we've been exploring here today. And around the theme that's on the name tag, to remove the old silos. Healthcare is very siloed. It's siloed by medical specialty, by body part, right? We used to think we still see doctors by what part of the body as opposed to the molecular biology or the genetics of the disease. So many new opportunities to rethink healthcare and frame it from where we are today, sick care to true healthcare. Now, uh, what do I mean by sick care? Sick care is the way we practice today. We get little bits of information, maybe a blood pressure, an EKG, maybe you have diabetes and you're sending by fax machine your blood sugar numbers to your doctor. So the data we get is intermittent and very episodic, and therefore we're quite reactive. We wait for that heart attack or stroke, or I'm a cancer doctor, for the cancer to present at late stage, late stage three or stage four. The future of medicine, combined with technology is to be much more continuous with our data and then much more proactive. And for all of us to be integrated with that information, not just waiting for that information to come to our doctors and to move the needle from sick care to health care and even to sort of optimizing our health and wellness along our health care journeys. So that's a little bit of framing about moving from sick care, intermittent and reactive to the future of uh, uh, continuous and proactive health care. Okay, so as we um, think about 
the role of, of technology. Uh, technology is important, and of course many amazing technologies are here today, many of them developed here in, in Japan. It's not just the technology is important, it's the mindsets, it's the incentives. It's not just having robots, but who pays for them? How do we change the, 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 the incentives? Because in, in Japan and in the United States, the incentives are really to treat the sick. We spend most of our healthcare dollar on folks who already have disease. The opportunity is to shift the incentives to taking care of ourselves and our patients early and prevent, preventing disease. And we have a whole new mindset for doing that because the way we're paying for medicine in many parts of the world doesn't pay for doing more procedures, more biopsies, more surgeries, but pays to keep people healthy or to have better outcomes, this idea of, of value-based care. And that, that also means we can change where healthcare happens. It's no longer just happening in the hospital, in the clinic, in the emergency room, but increasingly healthcare can come to our homes, to our phones, to onto our bodies, to inside our bodies, uh, and even to our you know, corner pharmacies. So where healthcare happens, how we pay for it, all these new technologies are set to shift uh, things dramatically. That includes meaning that each of us is empowered as a consumer to understand how much a drug cost or a device or comparing one hospital or one doctor to another. There's sort of the Yelps or the, the rating systems for doctors. Um, and all of this is coming quickly, right? We're now in 2017. It was only 10 years ago that the first you know, smartphone came out. Uh, that was 10 years ago this month, or next month that the first one was launched. Uh, Facebook launched out of universities 10 years ago. Airbnb was still a mattress company 10 years ago. Um, that, the world has dramatically shifted in 10 years. What might we see in the next 10 years in healthcare? Well, a lot of it, of course, rides on these magical technologies we've only had for 10 years. The, this is actually an antique. This is my iPhone 2, right? It's, uh, uh, it, it was, it looks an, it's an antique now, but at the time it was very good. And of course, next week, we're going to hear an announcement about the iPhone um, 8, and we'll see where those go. They keep getting better and faster. Um, but these, of course, have become medical devices. And we can in integrate more sensors and more communication in these. It empowers each of us to be our own physician uh, in some cases. Um, and of course, these ride exponential trends. We've been talking a lot about exponentials um, and gives us a new lens to uh, think about where these might take us. Because of course, the laptop of 2000 now fits on your smartphone, now fits on your smart watch. We now, of course, have computers the size of a grain of rice. All of them are becoming connected. The Internet of Things is turning into the Internet of Medical Things. And the speed of the networks, we're moving from 4G to 5G. 5G isn't going to be twice as fast or 10 times as fast. It's going to be 100 times faster. So many of the new Internet of Medical Things, we, here we see the Omron devices were on display last night, are going to be connected at high bandwidth and can it provide potentially very important information, not just about our cities and our homes and our environment, but about our health and our con continuous health care as well. So this new ability to connect data and information is often leading to a new era of healthcare called connected health or mobile health or, or digital health. Um, I think those are all buzzwords. Soon we'll just call it health. Um, but we don't call it you know, digital banking or digital movies, but it's going to enable us to connect new forms of information from apps to devices to drugs. This is a, a snapshot of the digital health landscape for many applications. And here in Japan, there are many com companies as well in the digital health space. So I encourage you to try them out. Some of them are okay, some of them are great, just like in any field. But it does give us that ability to now reshape how we access information, how we manage diagnostics, how we manage therapy. And again, many of those are riding exponential waves. Now, when you're thinking about exponentials in healthcare, don't just think about Moore's Law. Think about what you've heard about here already. Artificial intelligence, blockchain, 3D printing, virtual reality, uh, nanotech, all coming together and converging. It's at that convergence point that we really have the opportunity to rethink and reimagine healthcare from the rising costs to addressing our aging populations to how do we manage all the data coming at us. We have lots of data, but data by itself isn't useful. We need to make it actionable information. We also have challenges with our friends, the regulatory bodies in the United States. This is the FDA. Here's the FDMA, um, uh, our, our insurance companies. Lots of challenges. Even when we have great technology, we need the regulatory bodies and the policy and the incentives to match moving the, those things forward. So, of course, many challenges here, particularly with the aging population, is requiring new ways of thinking about managing prevention, diagnostics, and therapy. And, of course, 
Many of us from Singularity come from Silicon Valley, the home of Uber, which used to be the favorite example of exponential technologies. They haven't had a very good PR month or two. But think about Uber. They could not have existed 10 years ago. They're an exponential company. They, they didn't invent the smartphone, GPS, online payments. They connected the dots and, of course, have transformed transportation. Um, they're even disrupting themselves with self-driving uh, uh, Ubers that are in, in pilots. Uh, some of us had a ride yesterday in the robocar. Uh, very disruptive, a little bit scary. But, you know, we can think about the future of taxi drivers, but what about the future of doctors and nurses being sometimes replaced or augmented with these sorts of approaches? Um, Uber themselves is actually now rolling out something called circulation, so patients can get to clinics and hospitals easier. And even Uber has tried an app called Uber Health, where you press a button on the app, and a nurse comes to you to give you a flu shot. There's also Ubers for Health, where you press a button on the app, and a doctor or nurse comes to you. I'm not sure what kind of doctor, but you get a doctor. And um, the idea, though, is that we can use some of these new lenses, the ability of getting what we want when we want it in healthcare as we move forward, from drugs to insurance to, uh, to all these elements coming in very disruptive forms. Even Amazon is getting into the pharmacy business. So lots of new players are coming to disrupt healthcare, uh, from insurance companies using apps uh, to drones. So. Uh, it's imperative to all of us, whether you're in a healthcare a technology company or not, to think about getting out of our old silos and old mindsets, and particularly in healthcare, coming at it from new perspectives to Uber yourself before you get Kodak. All right. All right. So I have been lucky to be the chair of medicine at Singularity University since it started. And what's been interesting is about as almost everybody who's come to Singularity University has been very interested in, in healthcare. Um, we, have, we look at, at global grand challenges in our summer programs, but half of the new companies that have come out of Singularity University have been focused on healthcare. And because of that interest, I started a program six years ago now called Exponential Medicine, where we bring not just doctors, but patients and technologists and investors together across the healthcare spectrum to look at the future of medicine. Um, so every fall we get together now at the, in San Diego, the website is exponentialmedicine.com, and we spend four days looking at the future of medicine. So I encourage you, some of you to come join us this November 6th through 9th. Um, the group, everyone gets to wear scrubs. Uh, we've gotten so big now we have to take our picture uh, from a drone. There's our drone picture. Um, can we turn the sound up? Make sure the sound is on. Um, and uh, it's a great place. If you go to exponentialmedicine.com, a lot of talks and resources are there about the cutting edge of healthcare and technology. Okay. We're now going to look at four areas and how they apply to healthcare today. Health and prevention, diagnostics, therapy, and discovery. So let's start with health and prevention. We all want to live long and healthy lives. We're going to hear more from Raymond about genetics, which are and very important. But it's our behaviors that are actually the most important part of our healthcare journey. And now we can start to understand that the most risky behaviors, bad sleep, bad diet, smoking, lead to most of our chronic diseases and conditions. And we can now, in this day and age, start to measure our behaviors. How many of you are wearing a Fitbit or some wearable device? Does anyone have one on? How many have one at home in your drawer? You lost the charger? Okay. Anyway, most of you ha have some of these embedded in your phones and watches. These technologies are moving very quickly. They don't just track steps in sleep anymore. They can track all sorts of behaviors. We're seeing sensors being shrunk into our pills that can tell when you took your medications. So we're now entering an age where we can start to quantify and measure almost any element of human behavior in healthcare and use those in not just our homes and for sports, but in clinical settings as well. And many companies, many old companies are coming into the space. Philips is now making a whole set of digital devices. Nokia, which got knocked out of the phone business, is making digital health tools. And of course, Omron, who's here, has a whole set of amazing devices for blood pressure and blood sugar and wristwatches and, and beyond. So many new folks coming into the digital health space. And it's not enough for just us to collect this data and own it ourselves. The data, many of us are data geeks. We can connect, collect our data, we'll look at it on our watches, quantified self. It's moving to an era of quantified health, where that data from your blood pressure cuff and scale and sleep monitor is going to connect to your doctor and your healthcare team. So you can better measure your, your behaviors and your, and your measures, so you can do better management, diagnostics, and therapy. And if you go to England now, the National Health Service, they're, start, they're starting to pay for some of these technologies as part of the insurance. I wonder where here in Japan, where you're going to get prescribed a wearable device or a connected blood pressure cuff. I hope that's coming soon. So 
here's a few examples of things that already exist today. There are already watches out that can detect your heart rate, of course, and start to pick up disease. We're seeing blood pressure devices from Omron and others that can measure blood pressure directly on your watch. We can see blood sugar monitors that connect your smartphone and give you real-time blood sugar data for diabetics. Um, some of them are turning into digital tattoos that you can wear for, for two or three weeks that could collect data. We're seeing wearables come to our shoes that can track the gait of a patient if they have a risk for a fall. And we're quickly moving to the era of insidables, um, contact lenses from Google that can measure blood sugar uh, for diabetics, or sensors that can go underneath the skin that can measure real-time blood sugar, potassium, or other elements that might be important for tracking health. It might start with the military, but it might move to managing patients with chronic disease and, and censoring them 24-7. We're moving to the idea of trainables. Just getting data isn't enough. What if in our era of smartphone posture, right? Posture isn't very good. We could have a digital nudge. Well, this is a technology out of Israel called the upright. You put it on your back for about an hour a day and when you hunch over, it buzzes your back. And just about an hour a day for one week retrains your physiology to sit up straight, which might be helpful for some of you who have lower back pain or just want to have better posture. We're seeing Shockables, they might give you other information. Um, the idea of hearables are hearing devices. Don't just play music. They start to play now. They can track our heart rate and our steps. I'm wearing a ring, ringables today. This is a ring that can track my sleep, my heart rate, my temperature. So uh, sleep is a very important measure to health. Now we can start to track that and coach that. Um, we're seeing sensors being built into mattresses that can track our sleep seamlessly. Breathables, these are devices now that can track the quality of your breath if you're going on a date or maybe you want to track molecules that might be indicative of uh, early lung cancer, so tracking breath. Sweatables, let's say you're going for a run, we can measure your sweat, which might be useful again if you're running a marathon, but also for patients who have heart disease. Sockables, if a diabetic patient often can't feel their feet, the sock can detect their feet. If you drink a lot, there's something now called an <laughs> alcoholable wearable that'll track your blood alcohol level from your wrist. If you need that, you have other problems. Um, so bottom line, we can censor everything. We're going to see sensors dissolving into our clothes, ways to manage diseases like Parkinson's, tracking our tremor and optimizing the medications. Um, Toto is onto this, poopables, you know, lots of information that might be useful from our bathrooms. Um, and let's say you need a protectable. Let's say you had a new hip or knee implant, you're at risk for a fall, you might even want to wear your own airbag. Okay, so that's another kind of wearable. Uh, there are now wearables that can help manage pain. They inject energy or electricity. So bottom line, there's lots of new elements that are coming to bear. None of us, however, want to wear five different devices. We want to see them become integrated and integrated into one app, not 20 apps. And where I think this is taking us in this era of quantified health is that you are going to be the, the, the new drug. We're going to be empowered to own our information, to share that information. Uh, an Apple a day keeps the doctor away. The Apples, the Samsungs, the Googles, the Facebooks, all getting into healthcare. And then when we're connected to this sort of information all the time, that can incentivize us. If you run an eight minute mile or you're running, walking 10,000 steps a day, your insurance premium might be lowered. Lots of ways we're going to see new business opportunities to change our behaviors as we move into the future. So what about, what about our younger patients? We can even start to track the health of babies in the last trimester. These are wearables for the mother that track the health of the mother and the fetus. And when that baby is born, we might even track their information. This is a connected diaper from TweetPee, from Huggies. You can figure out what that might tell you. Or a connected teddy bear that can go in your child's crib to track their vital signs. Um, so new ways we'll be able to track our youngest patients and hopefully keep them healthy. Now, just because you can track the temperature of a baby or how much milk they drink, that's going to be sometimes overwhelming to a, a parent or a pediatrician. When is that activity going too far? How do we integrate that into our overall care. Here in Japan, you have this great system of tracking maternal and child health with a handbook, right? Imagine when that becomes completely digitized and we can pick up problems in children early rather than late, whether that's autism or other developmental issues or other diseases early. Mental health, another big issue in Japan and across the planet, is something we need to do a better job with. We can now use our wearable devices to track uh, our emotions. The cameras can pick up our, are we happy? Are we sad? Voice 
is a biomarker that can now be detected. Our Instagram um, photos can predict who's depressed or not. So new digital sensors can be used to pick up and manage folks with uh, depression or other issues. Voice as a biomarker. There's apps that you can download. This one called B the Moody's app can track voice and emotional state. So many new ways we can start to take voice. Even voice alone can tell who has heart disease or not. So we're going to enter an era where our, our digital connected internet of things can help manage our mental health and then provide us even with digital tools, digital psychologists to talk to. Here's an example. But I try to stay happy. So this um, is already developed. I, I'd rather the be app happy. can see your face, uh, your eyes, your voice, your gaze, and respond. What advice would you have given yourself 10 or 20 years ago? Um, to... Well, this doesn't replace uh, the psychologist, believe. but will be ad, uh, additive for extra visits. And companies like Google and others are, again, starting to integrate all these new sensors and signals to be used as new ways of detecting and managing and treating mental health issues. So where is this heading? Soon you're not going to need to wear anything because in our world of Internet of Things, even Wi-Fi can pick up the vital signs of up to 10 people in the same room. So soon, whether you want to or not, you're always going to be online with your digital health exhaust. And that provides opportunities and challenges. It's a bit of a so what if you have to keep recharging your device, if that data doesn't flow to your doctor or your dietitian or pharmacist. It needs to be integrated and smartly integrated into the workflow of the doctor and the nurse. Many of our medical record systems today are very poorly designed. The data doesn't flow. We need to connect the dots and make this information useful to not just you as an individual, but to your healthcare team as well. And that's starting to happen with HealthKit from Apple, that data can now flow to my medical record at Stanford. So my doctor can see my data if he logs in. Now, he doesn't want to log in and look at my Fitbit data every day. He wants to have a bit of a dashboard to my data. What if he had a score for every one of his 2,000 patients? Um, integrating not just my vital signs, but my activity, my social network strength, my financial health, all these elements that play a role in our short and long-term health. And if he has a dashboard of the five patients he really needs to call that day, They'll bring them into the clinic and help prevent them from moving farther into a, a medical situation. Here's another way to think about it. Think about the modern car of today. The modern car has three or 400 sensors in them. You don't care about any one sensor. What you care about is when your check engine light goes on. So I think in the near future, we'll have our own personal check engine light that's tuned to our data that will give us proactive information. So the sensors are, are going to become cheap and free. It's going to be the data systems on top and how you make sense of that that's going to become valuable. Um, here's a professor at Stanford who was wearing a lot of technology, check engine light for health. He discovered he had diabetes and Lyme disease probably months before he might have discovered it otherwise. So we're going to take lessons from cars like the Teslas of today have a hive mind. They share driving information. They start with a normal map, but they learn the routes. And when they learn about the curves in one road, they update the rest of the cars with a high precision map. What if we use that same hive mind in, in, in sharing information across Japanese medical systems, but also around the world? Now, having data is infra interesting. But we're not, not often honest with our own data and ourselves with that. We need to new, new, use new tools to help behavior change. We all know we might want to eat less and exercise more. Sometimes we need coaching. There now is a whole era of digital coaches where you can literally talk to a real person on the end of the line or a, a chatbot coach. This, this is an app called Lark you can try where it coaches you around diet and sleep and exercise. I think we'll soon see these digital coaches help us not with our diet and nutrition, but also managing diseases like diabetes and heart disease and cancer. And of course, they can remind me that I'm jet lagged and need to go to sleep early. We'll see robotics come into this play. We'll have home coaching from our robotics that are going to give us uh, insight. These, here's an example of where this might be soon. Meet the world's first artificial intelligence personal robot. She's your welcome friend at any hour. Good morning, Thomas. Time to get up. Good morning. It seems like you had a good night's sleep. Eight full hours and a good resting heart rate. Thank you. Your meeting with Jane is at 9.30. I put the coffee on. She can interface with household devices. And she's also a personal stylist. What do you think? Why don't you try the blue tie with it? 
good idea. You get the idea. That's already here, right? You can already talk to your Amazon Echo, Echo or Google Home, and they're going to become part of our medical system. They'll know how much insulin you need to take. We might remind you to take your medications or about your doctor's appointment or help Alexa, I've fallen, I can't get up and call the emergency for you. So these are going to become these chatbots and these interactives part of our healthcare coaching. You might see that coach when you look in the mirror in the morning, like they might give you a healthcare score. You might see you of today in the mirror, but what if when you looked in the mirror you saw you of tomorrow, right? You have tomorrow if you are on a diet or if you're working out or really doing workouts. Or what if you kept having uh, donuts, sugar donuts for breakfast, you have tomorrow? Ooh, not so pretty, right? You can see future you. Here's an app where it's me of today and me a thousand donuts later. I'm going to think twice about having the extra dessert. Or what if you have friends or children who smoke and you can show them what their face is going to look like before smoking after smoking, right? Or if they spend too much time on Facebook, what's going to happen, right? This is an example. This is an example of convergent technology, augmented and virtual reality. Augmented reality can be applied to healthcare. Obviously, here's my antique Google Glass. These are now being used in the operating room and by surgeons to see data or physicians to use this in the clinic in useful ways. We're going to see augmented reality uh, be used in all sorts of interesting ways from medical students and doctors and nurses seeing data or learning anatomy in very interactive and low-cost ways, um, all the way to seeing surgeons uh, start to use these technologies to do better procedures so you can see exactly where to put the device and see inside and sort of see through the patient, for example. Um, we're going to see augmented reality come to our workplace, interacting with our objects, whether that's anatomy objects or our financial records. All this is coming uh, very quickly. We're going to see new ways to educate ourselves. This is a shirt I have at home. So for kids who want to learn anatomy, they can sort of do blended reality, right? Very empowering ways to learn about your own health and for your children, for example, to learn about their insides. And here's my son, Leo, who's three. He now knows where his heart and lungs are and a good way to educate children about uh, health information. Um, so we're going to have new lenses on health information. I've been a fighter pilot or a flight surgeon in the Air National Guard. When we fly with fighter jets, we have heads-up displays. What if we had a heads-up display for our health care, giving us guidance? It knows when we're in a dogfight and can tell us where the bad guy is. It also can tell us we're about to hit a mountain and we need to pull up, right? Pull up. So we could use sort of heads-up displays in our health care. Let's say we're on a diet. We can see our breakfast in one way before and a new way next, right? It may give us, before we eat that breakfast, cool. another ah. warning. So we're going to see virtual reality, I think, explode across healthcare. There's expensive versions you've tried here. There's the low-cost versions where you put your smartphone into Google Cardboard. We're seeing virtual reality therapy come. For example, folks who have burn injuries can go into cold environments and throw snowballs and feel co colder. We're seeing it be used for physical therapy. We're being, seeing it being used in, 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 in clinical environments to keep people feel relaxed in a hospital setting. We're seeing it be used to educate medical students to learn uh, about heart anatomy so you can actually walk inside the heart and learn uh, about all its chambers, or if a child has a, a, a heart malformation, you can understand that in detail, or the parents or the patient. So I think we're all going to be learning education in new ways, in powerful ways with virtual uh, reality. This is just one example. Um, we're seeing virtual reality surgery, where now surgeons are going into the operating room, putting on VR goggles, and watching a surgery that's been recorded, or watching a surgery in real time. I was in London a year and a half ago for the first live stream VR surgery. 2,000 people were watching the surgery around the world in real time, so that future medical education is coming. The surgeon even uses Snapchat goggles to so record the, surgery. The so many new ways to democratize the education, and, the and these are just a few examples. And of course, we can use this for, for making our runs. Our Pokemon Go is really a healthcare game, uh, a new way to get engaged with walking. Since Pokemon Go has walked, over 4 billion miles have been walked with people playing the game. So it becomes a, a healthcare tool as well. What about health prevention with genomics? Raymond's going to talk more about genomics. The price of sequ sequencing has gotten really inexpensive. It's down to about 1,000 US dollars. We can now use very low cost genetics to look at risk of disease. Here's my data. I can see I have a higher risk of kidney disease. I can look at my risk, my response to certain drugs. What if each of us owned our genetic information and your doctors and medical team knew that information? You can now get your genome done for about $1,000. It will soon become integrated into our healthcare systems for $100. So five years from now, I expect all of you to be sequenced. Um, 
There are now app stores that have been launched for your genome. They can look at your athletic ability or what wine you might like based on your taste buds. So lots of interesting applications. Some of them are just for fun. Beyond the, micro the genome, there's our microbiome, the, gut, the bugs in our gut and on our body play a role in everything from obesity to inflammatory bowel disease. You can now, for $80, sequence your microbiome and use that to understand maybe your risk for certain diseases. We're starting to understand microbiome's role in, in Parkinson's and in Alzheimer's. We're seeing the ability to transplant microbiomes to cure folks with infections of their GI system. We're seeing the ability now to understand your microbiome and use that to personalize diets. So instead of giving everybody the same diet, we're going to soon be prescribing diets based on our genome and our microbiome and beyond. There's old technologies we can use, you know, Zen Buddhism, meditation, yoga. We can use these to optimize our brains. These are free technologies, but we can apply technologies like brain-computer interfaces. This is a brain-computer interface that's on the market that I can use to track my meditation and make it a bit of a game. I could prescribe this to a patient with anxiety or depression and, or to patients who have um, uh, attention deficit disorder. They learn to focus with headset on and now they can get off of drugs like Ritalin. So many new ways we're going to be prescribing video games and brain-computer interfaces to optimize our brain health as we go uh, further. So lots happening in that space. I'll skip through this. Um, what about um, brain-computer interfaces? I think you've heard about those already. Let's move to diagnostics, right? We want to pick up disease early rather than late. Um, here in Japan, uh, I understand you have a pretty interesting system called the, the Ninjin Doc. How many of you have done this, right? Some of you have done this? It's a whole sort of one day, go through all the sorts of diagnostics. I think many of these diagnostic platforms, sometimes as epitomized here, you'll start to be able to do for yourself at home because we now have a whole new set of digital tools for doing early diagnosis. Some of them will be for measuring our brain. What if we could pick up Alzheimer's disease 10 years early based on brain scans or blood tests or eye tracking games? Those already exist. We might be able to take some of the new drugs that are in clinical trials, and use those at stage zero before there are symptoms for folks who are developing or at risk for um, brain diseases. We have a whole new set of digital doctor tools that you could use to manage disease at home. For example, your Apple Watch can now pick up if you have a funny heart rhythm, and that might mean you should then go to see your cardiologist. We can use little attachments to look in your child's ear to do an ear exam instead of bringing your child to the pediatrician, or to do that exam as a digital exam with your pediatrician on the phone. Hopefully she, he or she is going to get paid as a doctor to do that digital exam. We're going to see a whole new set of diagnostic kits coming to our workplaces and our homes that can help make care smarter and more local. And then when we're doing diagnostics, whether it's your smartphone looking at a skin rash, increasingly the artificial intelligence is going to understand what the problem is. It's going to say, is that, is that um, skin lesion a melanoma? Uh, or just a, a skin rash or, or a mole. So many technologies are coming to get bear to look, for example, at the back of the eyeball and now use machine learning and AI to make the diagnostics. So Google is getting into this and DeepMind. Or we're seeing the ability for Google and others to look at pathology. Look at and do a job better than pathologists with unlimited time. That's already today. So very soon, dermatologists, radiologists, pathologists, I don't think they're going to be replaced with artificial intelligence, but they're going to be augmented. They're going to start blending their roles. And these companies are already out there and moving very, very quickly uh, in the space. What about the area of, of heart disease? Number one killer here in Japan and the US. We now have technologies like the AliveCore EKG. You put this EKG case, you put this on your phone and you can re record your EKG. They have a new version that's coming out called the Cardia that will be on your Apple Watch. And they're partnered now with Omron uh, to take this into the clinical realm. Uh, they partner with the Omron blood pressure kit as well. So what used to take an EKG in the clinic and a blood pressure in the clinic, you can now do at home to manage very common cardiac and other conditions. So smart ways of low-cost diagnostics can be useful today. This is already here. This is not the future. Um, we're seeing the advent of patches you can wear, a little band-aid that can track your heart rate, your temperature, your position, your steps. If you fall down, it could call your mother or call an emergency. Uh, that's an intensive care unit level of information on a patch. So many new ways of doing diagnostics, including replacing the ways we'll look at our heart. Let's say, for example, your EKG shows a problem with your heart. Instead of going and having a needle, a catheter up the heart, we can do a virtual angiogram. 
30 second CT scan of the heart, send that data to the cloud, and now analyze with math how narrow your blood vessels are and determine do you, uh, is your blood vessel so narrow that you need a surgery or do you need a stent? Maybe we'll 3D print the stent for you. Um, we're seeing, again, ways of digitizing exams that used to be very invasive that will be less expensive and more accurate. And we're being inspired by the diagnostics of Star Trek. Some of you remember Star Trek and the medical tricorder? Well, I've been involved with the X Prize, and we developed a $10 million prize to develop a real medical tricorder. And hundreds of teams entered this competition to make a home diagnostic that could do a, jo a better job than a regular doctor at diagnosing the most common medical conditions that you'd find at home. And one of the companies started at Exponential Medicine. They made this little scanner to scout. You hold it to your forehead. It pulls down your temperature, your heart rate, your oxygen saturation, calculates your blood pressure, talks to IBM Watson on your smartphone. They also developed smart ways of doing urinalysis. You can dip uh, this in the urine at home and then use the app on your camera to take a picture and determine whether you might have an infection or other problems with your urine. So smart ways of doing home-based diagnostics I think will be part of the future of medicine. I think we'll all have some sort of medical tricorder in our homes in the next five to ten years. And that will be part of the, and this prize was won by an emergency medicine doctor out of uh, Philadelphia. We're just in the, in the process of developing a new X prize for cancer diagnostics. So if any of you are interested in competing, uh, come join the Cancer X Prize. We want to make it as easy to detect lung, prostate, breast, many cancers, as easy as a urine dipstick for, uh, for pregnancy moving into the future. Now, I've talked about a lot of technologies, a lot of data. It's really important now to connect the dots because the average doctor can't keep up with the information. We don't want just evidence-based medicine. We want intelligence-based medicine. And of course, you've heard about IBM Watson, artificial intelligence, AI. I like to think more of it as IA, intelligence augmentation. Almost every part of health and medicine is going to be infused with AI, not to replace the doctor or the nurse, but to help augment our skills, to do what the doctor does well, and augment that with what machine intelligence can do well in terms of reading studies and integrating lots of information. Okay, my last 10 minutes. What about the future of therapy? We want, uh, th so together, humans and machines. We want therapy to be more precise, less invasive, less expensive. We don't want to have surgery. What if you could have, uh, oh, uh, there's many technologies, of course, being d developed here. Uh, Let's go back a second, sorry. Um, many technologies here in Japan that are very advanced. Um, but we sometimes want to even avoid the intervention. We're seeing the ability now to do MRI-guided focused ultrasound instead of surgery. So you can take ultrasound and focus it into a beam and heat up an area. For example, a woman might have a uterine fibroid. In this case, you could focus ultrasound beams and knock out that uterine fibroid without ever having an open surgery. Or if someone has many tumors in their liver or their lungs or the brain, to use a similar non-invasive approach to so the future of surgery may be very non-invasive. Other forms of therapy you'll hear more about from Raymond is gene therapy, the idea of CRISPR, the idea that we're going to cure diseases with gene therapy. For example, sickle cell disease is a one gene problem in the bone marrow stem cells. We're now going to use things like CRISPR to replace that in the bone marrow and cure patients using gene therapy and bone marrow transplantation. So the whole era of CRISPR and gene therapy is moving very quickly. You'll hear more about that from Raymond, including modifying embryos, lots of ethical and other elements, but getting very exciting. Other therapeutics is once you have a drug, what it, m many folks don't take drugs as prescribed. We're starting to see an era where our drug, our pill bottles are connected and can remind us to take our medications. There's a company called Proteus Biomedical that's got a sensor that can tell when you've taken your pill. They're partnering with Atsuka on an antidepressant, uh, which is coming to market in the next year or so, to track when folks have taken their medications. Very important part of therapy is taking your therapy. We're seeing electroceuticals. These are devices that aren't drugs or uh, pure devices, but blend elect electricity. Pacemakers for the heart, pacemakers for the brain, pacemakers for the gut, pacemakers for managing snoring, sleep apnea, or for managing contraception underneath the skin with a remote control. What happens when uh, you, uh, honey, where's the remote? Or what if someone hacks your remote control for your contraception? Or if someone hacks your pacemaker? 
very interesting issues with privacy and data control. We're already seeing many examples of hospital systems and others becoming hacked and medical records being hacked. Uh, we're seeing uh, the applications of Bitcoin and blockchain as important elements of maybe addressing that issue. We're coming to an era where we might prescribe apps, apps for diabetes or apps for heart disease. Mayo Clinic showed that they could reduce readmissions from hospitals with patients uh, by using simple applications uh, or using apps built into glucometers. So this is all taking us to an era where we're going to have a digital checkup anywhere we might be using our wearables, using our sensors, using our medical tricorders. We're going to have virtual checkups, not just with screens that you see your doctor on the smartphone, but other ways of interacting with our healthcare systems. Even, for example, with using HoloLens and beyond, where you can feel like you're in the same room with your doctor or your surgeon without having to come to the hospital for every single visit. You might even have an avatar of your doctor made to be on your app. It looks just like your physician. Uh, and chatbots are coming. So many of the first parts of our healthcare, particularly for folks who don't have good access, will be these chatbots that can do early screening and early diagnostics. What about robotics? Robotics is playing a role in healthcare, especially here in Japan. Uh, robotic anesthesiologists have come to market. We're seeing uh, robotics play a role in, uh, in, in folks with disability. Uh, we're seeing robotics been used here in Japan uh, for nurses to help carry patients or to provide elderly patients companionship. Some of these wearable exoskeletons have components that are 3D printed. 3D printing is something that's coming to healthcare uh, in ways of personalizing elements for a cast, for example, that might be 3D printed to match your arm, to make your own personalized hip or knee implant or medical devices that might be printed in the operating room that might be disruptive to the medical device world. One of our Singularity University companies has made a 3D printer that's gone to the space station, and they've started to print the, the first 3D printed medical devices on space station. You might want to 3D print your own tumor, as my friend Stephen Keating did. He printed his own tumor and gave that to his surgeons. This is the actual side of his tumor that helps his surgeons do his surgery. Uh, and of course, you can, of course, 3D print yourself, which might be fun, but might have relevance if you need to make a prosthetic for a patient or to print your own pills that match your personalized dosage. You might even want to think about 3D printing organs. We're still kind of far away from 3D printing organs, but we're going to start to start to see an era where we won't wait for printed organs. We're going to modify pigs and put in human genes in pigs so we can take organs from pigs as the organ transplant. I think this is two or three years out from the clinic. It will be far ahead of 3D printing organs as we move into this fast-moving future. Um, Regenerative medicine is part of this era. Regenerative medicine uh, is the idea of repairing, replacing, or regenerating tissues that have been damaged by aging, disease, or trauma. Uh, we have many elements of there, from embryonic stem cells to adult stem cells. Bone marrow uh, is a very rich source of adult stem cells. We use those in the field of bone marrow transplantation. We're now in the era of uh, induced pluripotent stem cells. Your very famous uh, Shian Yamanaka, a physician here, developed the ability to take any skin cell from your body and reprogram that, for example, to turn into your own embryonic stem cell line that has many applications across medical diagnostics and therapy. I think in the near future, you may be able to take a skin cell, send it to a tissue bank, make your own set of tissues, have those ready to go in the freezer should you need them if after an accident or stroke or heart attack. And again, that, wor that work has been pioneered here in China. And the first clinical trials for treating eye diseases have been recently carried out here in Tokyo and in the rest of China. So a very exciting area. But I've been involved in the area of stem cell transplantation uh, in the field of bone marrow transplantation, an area that's been going on for 50 years. And that is the idea that we can take bone marrow stem cells and use those to treat patients with cancer. Um, I'll tell you a small story about solving a medical problem. I was a bone marrow transplant fellow at Stanford, and we're using bone marrow to treat cancer patients and heart patients. But getting bone marrow is difficult. We have to take a big needle and put it into the, the hip bone of a patient. And I was spending time in the operating room getting a liter bone marrow using a big needle like this and putting it in the, the rear end of the patient like 100 times. So my hand was sore, and the rear end of the patient would look like Swiss cheese. So I thought, there must be a better way of doing that. So I ended up developing a little medical device. I brought it with me called the marrow miner. So instead of doing hundreds of punctures in the bone marrow, you could do a little, uh, here's a video of how it works. You could do a, um, let's see if the video works. Uh, the video is not working. Um, basically, you could now take this device and go into the marrow cavity 
and turn it on. And instead of doing hundreds of punctures, you could stay inside the marrow and suck out what used to take an hour in about five minutes. So we've now developed this technology to the point where uh, it's been in patients, it's FDA approved, and we can get out stem cells from you or anybody else who needs it very, very quickly. Not only can we do that much more quickly, we get about twice as many stem cells out in about a quarter of the amount of time. So this is now a device that's moved to the clinic. I know a lot of folks in Japan are interested in regenerative medicine. So if you're interested, come talk to me. We're taking this hopefully to Japan and the rest of the world as quick, easy ways to get your own bone marrow out when you're healthy, or if you need to donate marrow uh, and give it to others. Okay, last two minutes. These technologies in healthcare, from digital health to stem cells to big data, can now democratize healthcare. Um, we now have three billion people are going to come online in the next couple years. Many folks have limited access to healthcare today, but almost all of them have SMS phones. Soon all of them will have smartphones. And with smartphones and apps and chatbots and access to digital diagnostics, we can bring healthcare anywhere in the world. And now we can even deliver medical devices and blood products by drones. One of our Singularity University companies called Mannernet has pioneered the idea of drones to deliver healthcare uh, uh, technology in cities and in rural areas after earthquake, after disaster, after hurricanes. Um, so we're going to see new ways of blending access and delivery. Even de de delivering a defibrillator should you need it wherever you might be or drone ambulances, uh, which will be here soon. Okay, to finish this all up, I'd like us all to think about the future of discovery. How do we speed up um, new ideas? Because the technology by itself isn't going to advance unless we can prove these new things work, whether it's an app, a drug, or a device. How do we rethink clinical trials? You can now donate your data from your genomics, from your microbiome, from your digital exhaust. You can download clinical trials from Research Kit. There might be clinical trials for heart disease or for tracking Parkinson's or beyond where the sensors on your phone are part of the, uh, the element. You might be using it, taking a drug from a pharma company and using the app to track the, the trial. We're going to see this crowdsourced future of healthcare kind of like we drive today with Google Maps. Ten years ago, we barely had smartphones. Today, you couldn't imagine driving with a paper map. Imagine the future of healthcare is like driving today with Google Maps where we share the data. We know where the bad cops are, where the traffic jams are, and we can guide our healthcare journeys. I think the future of medicine will be similar to crowdsourcing uh, medical information. We cannot just be organ and blood donors, but data donors as well. So as you think about the future of medicine, think about the combination of genomics, crowdsourcing, big data, 3D printing, nanotech, all coming together. Don't think about where the technology is here in 2017. Think about where it's going to be in 20, 2020, 2025. Skate to where the puck is going to be, as Wayne Gretzky, the hockey player, says. And if we do that, we can all play a role in the future of healthcare, from sick care, episodic and reactive sick care, to continuous and proactive and participatory healthcare. And we can all not just take linear steps, but exponential ones as we move into this future where we don't predict the future, but together we create a brighter future for health and medicine. So with that, domo regato. Thank you.